I pray and ask you, dear Lord. Rufus Rochelle prays three times a day. He prays for the friends he left behind in a place with one of the highest COVID-19 rates in the country, prison. When I was inside, it was quite scary. And you don't never know when you close your eyes at night whether you're going to be sick with this virus the following day. People behind bars are infected by the coronavirus at a rate more than five times higher than the general population. Rufus is so worried about it that he wants to shout it to the world. And so at 69 years old, he's figured out how to go live on Facebook. As long as you keep them locked up behind bars, the odds are against them. The odds are against them. Overcrowded, unsanitary, inadequate medical care. The same conditions that have been called out in prisons and jails for decades have turned them into COVID hotspots holding 2.3 million Americans. How is this okay? How can you stand back and watch this inhumane treatment? Advocates and public health experts are pushing governors to release hundreds of thousands of inmates, but resistance is high. The stakes are higher. When you got three men stacked on top of one another, Time is essence because they might not make it. Yes, this is uh, Rufus Rochelle calling in accountability. Rufus is calling into a halfway house. He's out of prison but still in custody, finishing a 40 year drug sentence at his sister's home near Gainesville, Florida. He's been transferred from prison to home confinement. He's one of more than 8,000 federal inmates allowed to do this. They're a group deemed both medically at risk and nonviolent. Yes, I feel safer. I am still in prison. Let's not get that mistaken. In late March, former Attorney General William Barr wrote a memo prioritizing home confinement where appropriate to protect the health and safety of prison personnel and the people in our custody. But that memo isn't enough, some public health experts argue. And unless we let out masses of people, nearly 100,000 could die of COVID. That's according to an ACLU study. Local jails have become veritable volcanoes for the spread of the virus into their surrounding communities. There are 10 million jail admissions every year, one every three seconds. The high turnover there means people arrested and then released can carry the virus in and out. This is what's going on as I'm sitting right here. Rufus is using his home confinement to do these Facebook Lives. He does them every single night. I think I got 2,000 and some friends now. And I was told that's a lot of friends. <laughs> again and again, he makes the same demand. Give them clemency. Commute their sentences. Allow them to go home. It's the same urgency Cynthia Carter Young felt as her brother neared the end of his 25-year prison sentence. He told me, said, a couple of the correction officers is out sick with the coronavirus. And the next week, he told me, man, two of them died. Leonard Carter had been granted parole in January. He was set to be released in the spring. He said, I really hope. I don't get it because we're not out there, so I hope they don't bring it in. In mid-April, Cynthia's phone rang. Leonard had COVID. And they called me and told me that his heart stopped beating, but we revived him. He was on oxygen, then a respirator. I said, bye, I love you. And he said, I love you more. Those were the last words. He died a little over a month before he was supposed to be released. Pass gently into the next life, Leonard. We hold your memory as a blessing. Leonard was 60. We're nothing. We're nothing without God. And I'm here, I bear witness today. Like Rufus and Leonard, 
nearly 250,000 prisoners are considered aging 55 and older. 40% of the overall prison population has at least one chronic health condition, and a disproportionate number are people of color. So the same communities that are overrepresented in prisons and jails are also the ones that have suffered most at the hands of COVID-19. Look, this is about human dignity and respect, right? This is about how are we going to treat some of America's most vulnerable people. It's like you're silent in there, and no one is hearing your voice. I am not silent. I am a voice. I am a voice that's an awakening. Word came recently a prisoner close to Rufus was getting out, his brother. Richard Williams, freed after 29 years and 11 months. Right. Just don't leave me here. <laughs> I'm ready. Richard was serving two life sentences for selling drugs until a few weeks ago when a judge ruled that he'd served long enough for a nonviolent crime and that his poor health could not be ignored right now. I know when he's out of here, I'm free now. Rufus and Richard both served time here at Coleman Federal Prison, and the guards always told them they'd walk out together. But the brothers worried COVID would be a death sentence the courts hadn't imposed. For the past several months, since March, we basically lived in, a, in one room. We do 35 days lockdown. That means you not only leave 24 hours a day, you take a shower three times a week. You don't come out. It's not just inmates who feel unsafe. Correction workers from Arizona to Georgia Illinois to California to Connecticut have raised safety concerns. In New York, the Correctional Officers Union bought 100,000 masks for its workers because the state was slow to respond. The memory still weighs heavily on the union's vice president. We've lost members, and maybe unnecessarily, that if um, our concerns early on with the Department of Corrections and Community Supervision and the Office of Mental Health had listened to our concerns early on, maybe those members would still be here today. They even commented they weren't going to provide masks because of the optics, that we were looking like we were, um, you know, promoting a virus of being this contagion, right? That it, not, it wasn't believed to be back in March. But now we have a whole different picture. Around 420,000 correction staff go in and out of prisons and jails every day. Over 84,000 of them have tested positive for the coronavirus. 139 have died. With those numbers in mind, criminal justice advocates reached out to guards and other correction workers, even suggested they all team up to push for prisoner releases. It's been disheartening, the response, frankly. Um, the response has basically been, well, we're looking out for our own as if all of our safety and well-being isn't sort of tied up with each other. Safety and well-being are always part of the conversation now, anytime Tiana Jenkins talks to her brother in prison. Taiwu Jenkins does not feel safe there, not around the guards. Taiwu was sentenced to 40 years for assault, and he served half his time. He has chronic asthma, so he's high risk. When I'm alone in my thoughts, um, Excuse me. It hurts so much because I know him better than anyone, and I know he doesn't deserve this. Around half of all adults in the U.S. have had an immediate family member locked up for at least a night. Legal Aid went to court to get Tai Wu and hundreds more out. 
a judge dismissed Tai Wu's petition, writing, Surely their right to be protected from the virus must be weighed against the right of their victims, their victims' families, and members of the public to be safe from them. Richard Pompilio represents victims, and he knows the terrain personally. His son was murdered, and the killer is nearing the end of his prison sentence in New Jersey, a state that just freed thousands of inmates to address a high COVID death rate. Richard doesn't know if his son's killer is about to get out. And the only reason I don't know is because I haven't made inquiry. And it may sound a little bit strange, but even after 31 years, it's, it's, it's so painful it's, to confront. So we haven't even gotten to that point. Some in law enforcement say letting hundreds of thousands out of prisons and jails will only start a new crisis. The system is already overburdened, and now you want to reintegrate these individuals back into society, try to find a job, try to find them housing, try to find them the appropriate medical uh, help. They don't have those capabilities. Despite the resistance, at the start of the pandemic, governors in 15 states signed executive orders encouraging or mandating releases, but none of those orders were fully implemented. The buck stops with governors, and they have failed. And unless we get them out today, people are going to die. They're going to die inside prisons and jails, and, 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 and these infections are gonna to spread to the rest of the United States, and they already have. What is the answer? Nobody seems to have one. So at random, one person, two people may get relief, and several hundred will not. Richard will now report to a parole officer for the next decade. Rufus remains under constant monitoring. He can't really go beyond the front yard without permission. He's determined to send his message much farther than that. We are ones that are not going to let your sons and daughters die behind bars based on COVID-19. We are on a mission 